Welcome back, my friends, my royal family. I am keeping you all in prayer. I'm hoping you're healthy and happy and getting through. Um, I have put some prayers out there as people have requested. I put three or four of them out there. We're going to do another one today, a prayer for the world, a uh, prayer of awakening uh, today. I've done a healing one, a strength one, a fear one. Um, just trying to put them out there. I think they were good suggestions from a couple of people. And uh, we also had another suggestion about possibly doing a live version of praying together on uh, uh, an application called Zoom, I believe it is. Uh, one of these meeting type of applications. I don't know how that would work, and I don't know what direction we'd go in with who would show up for that kind of stuff. But those are good thoughts. Those are good suggestions. I am taking them into account, and I am praying about these things. And I try to get filled with the Spirit, as always, and go forward. And as I'm filled with the Spirit and feel like I'm being led in a direction, I'll do something. Um, there's never a bad suggestion. It's just I have to feel it's the right thing to do, and it's, and it's going to work, and I'll be able to do it and put myself into it 100%. So um, having said that, I want to shout out to Ravel and his father, Van Leer, um, in Maryland, very uh, doctrinal men. Uh, Ravel's a young guy who I believe God's going to use in some form or another. He, he supports this ministry in a lot of different ways. He sends me emails and questions, information sometimes, um, and he's also financial support. Just a really uh, good, good folks. A couple of good doctrinal men in Maryland. I always say down in, uh, up in Maryland, but it's down in Maryland, I guess, down the coast in Maryland. And I'd like to go there. There's a couple of spots I'd love to go into a conference. That happens to be one of them. Uh, I've never walked through Washington, D.C. I'd like to do uh, a walk through the, you know, Washington the Monument and all that kind of stuff. So that's something I'm thinking about. And obviously out in South Dakota, Chad and Jessica, and we got folks in Missouri like Cameron and a couple other folks out that way. Uh, I'd like to get out there, and they, they're very supportive of me. Um, you know, I just uh, people are sometimes are so generous; it's very humbling. It almost brings a tear to your eye uh, when they're when they're that generous and they're that uh, uplifting to you. So that's how I feel right now. Um, having said that, I do want to tell us today is what April fifth, year of our Lord, twenty twenty. The title is Respect for Authority is a Key Principle. It is one of the pillars, I would say, a key principle within that God's divine establishments. We've been studying the four divine establishments. Without authority, none of those are upheld. And you have to see authority woven through all of those. The respect for authority, the chain of command, is woven in all those. And we're going to be taking a look at that today in the next couple lessons, actually. It is Lesson 154 in our Matthew series. We've been doing a study in Matthew chapter 13. We are in Lesson 154. Um, we're going through the whole book of Matthew. Uh, for those of you that are new, I have a couple of new followers. Welcome. I saw a couple of names I think you know, I even know from high school. Um, who would have thunk it, right? Long-haired wild man, Rick Betts, as a pastor. Um, yes, I am. God uh, God often chooses those <laughs> those that, that, that uh, the world would not choose. You know, 1 Corinthians tells us he, he chooses those that aren't the wisest, aren't the smartest, aren't the strongest the base things of the world to uh, to show those that are in power that, uh, you know, it is God that's a, that's the one who we need to respect. So um, I just kind of chuckle to myself when I see different names on places like Facebook and whatnot, people you know you grew up with. Um, but I got to go where God's leading me. So uh, I want to say a prayer for the whole world. And um, as we do that, we'll uh, also open up in, in what I uh, always like to do is in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth, and like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. And in 1 John 1 8, I always read 1 John 1 8, 1 9, and 1 10. It says, if we say, believers, we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, the truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, his word is not in it. We're going to take in us, excuse me, we're going to take a moment of silent prayer and we're going to wash away the garbage, get ready to take in the word of God. And right after that, we're going to do a prayer of awakening for the whole world. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study a word. And we're asking you to touch those believers that lift this type of small ministry up, the grace-based non-denominational ministries that are just trying to teach your word as the apostles did back in the day, Father. That's all we're trying to do is just get the word, the deciphering of the word and where the Spirit is leading us, Father. That's what we're trying to do. 
and lift those people up that take these ministries and promote them and lift them up and support them, Father. They need your hand on them, Father, because without them, this type of ministry does not go forward, Father. So we want to keep those folks in prayer and lift up these messages, get them out to a lost and dying world. Father, right now, I want to pray for a, a worldwide awakening, a worldwide awakening. And I know there are certain events that are going to take place, and I know there are certain bits and pieces of information that might shock some people coming up. Um, I do my own research, and I believe what is coming is going to be very difficult for some people to understand. The lies of the government, the lies around the world that have been going on, deceit, and it is really satanic, and a lot of things that have been going on, Father. And, and I want you to be able to touch those people that don't understand these things or are just now turning back to you or turning towards you. Maybe they're new believers, maybe they're old believers that are turning back. Father, give them the strength and the courage I've prayed about. Let them remove the fear and the worry and the anxiety I've prayed about. And Father, now is a time of a great awakening. That is what I, I'm praying for today, a great awakening across the world, Father, an awakening to truth, because truth is singular. It is not plural. There is not all different truths. There are not five different gods in the sky doing everything. There is only one. There is only one way to heaven, and it is through Jesus Christ, faith alone, and Christ alone. And, Father, there is only one truth. Therefore, I like people to get to the awakening, Father, and touch that awakening that I know is out there, Father, of everybody turning to your truth because I believe time is short, Father, and now is the time. This is our last call. I believe this is my personal opinion, Father, and I believe you're leading me in this direction. That's why I wrote the book I wrote. That's why I teach the way I teach because I believe we are in the last call now, Father. This is the last call, the last opportunity for people to wake up now as we go forward. We can be a positive remnant, a positive pivot, of believers that go forward and help to get the word out there and we can prolong father certain things on this earth so we can go forward and get the family and friends and those people that have not come to know the truth get them born again and saved through your power it's not through us it's through your power father but now is the time now is the great awakening father and that's what i'm praying for the people to wake up wake up to the one truth the singular truth of the word of god the accurate truth not the denominational nonsense, not the lies and religion, Father, that have been put out there by Satan himself, but real true spirituality, which is a relationship with you and an understanding of your word, Father, and just an honest study of your word. Father, I'm asking all these things through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hopefully that's going to be the awakening we need, that everybody needs to get on board and realize that uh, everything isn't what it has seemed for so long. And I often joke around and say, look at the movie, The Matrix. Um, and sometimes we've been living in the matrix and people are going to find out. Uh, they say, take the red pill or the blue pill. I think the red pill is the good one. So take that one and wake up, right? But there is only one truth that is singular, folks. So let's jump right into it. We're in Matthew uh, 13. That's not necessarily where we're going to go right off the bat. But um, noting the doctrine of historical trends, we've been in this means we have to open up a clear view into God's divine establishment. I've tried to make those clear, the four establishments that God has done in his divine will. Now also, free will. Free will is the first one you need to pay attention to. Him. Freedom, free will is the first one of God's divine establishments. Christian marriage is the second. We've touched on that. The Christian family also is in that. And then the fourth one is nationalism. So Matthew 13, 35, I'll put it on the board. You don't have to turn there because we're going to jump around some other scriptures today as well. But what's Matthew 13, 35, where our study has been taking us? This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, Jesus said. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. This points us to mystery doctrine of the church age, spiritual discernment coming into view at this point in Christ's teaching. That's really what Jesus Christ is getting into. He's got himself some serious followers, some church leaders that are going to be establishing his word and finishing the New Testament and in doing that, he needs to wake them up to mystery doctrine, and they need to have spiritual discernment. Their spiritual IQ needs to be very sharp as far as what is to come and what is going on. Because the church age that we're living in right now, the church, the church age kicked off at the, cro the cross of Christ. When it, when it really opened up was when the Holy Spirit descended the day of Pentecost upon those believers, and they went forward. You read that in the book of Acts as well. Because the church age is a time of guidance and discernment strictly from the word of God and the filling power of the Holy Spirit. It is not centered on prophecy other than knowing what is to come after the rapture. We have to have our spiritual glasses on, folks, to discern the times we're living in. You understand what I'm telling you? We have to have our spiritual 
IQ sharpened to understand the time we're living in because all prophecy has been written. It is there for us, but it really pertains to what is coming in the future. The majority of prophecies have been fulfilled. What is left, what few prophecies are left, point to the seven-year tribulation period, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Nothing to do with the church age. We don't need prophecy to be fulfilled in this church age. This study then has to push us into a look at the doctrine of historical trends and in that doctrine, one principle outshines the others, and that is the one word that many people do not like to study and do not like to recognize. Authority. Yes, and respect for authority. Turn to Matthew chapter 8. Go to Matthew chapter 8. We can note something right off the bat about authority, folks. We will look at how authority or the variations of that Greek word for authority were used when the New Testament was written. We can look at as well. The believer who desires growth. Spiritual growth we're talking about here, and divine insight that comes with that, we'd say spiritual discernment, needs to first be a student of the chain of command and all that an authority encompasses. If you understand authority in the chain of command, you'll know what I'm talking about. If not, maybe you need to really get into this study today. This might be a refresher for some people that have been in the military or been involved in a church that understands divine authority. If not, maybe this is your first um, taste of it, I would say, but you need to pay attention until they understand, until anybody, especially believers, understand that, then it, then this, that this authority I'm talking about, a chain of command, until they understand and then incorporate, incorporate, not just understand, incorporate, apply, okay, this concept into their daily lives, spiritual growth and discernment will never fully flourish in their lives. Those are the things you want. You want spiritual growth. You want spiritual IQ, spiritual discernment. They can't flourish and grow without you understanding a chain of command and authority itself. So if you've never understood those things before, you, you know, welcome today to start understanding them. Hopefully you won't turn it off because many people do not like to study authority in all the realms it's taught in the Bible. Here is a simple definition anyone can look up, but very few understand it, and even few follow it or apply it. In a military context, the chain of command is the line of authority and responsibility along with which orders are passed within a military unit and between different units. In more simple terms, what does it say? The chain of command is a succession of leaders through which command is exercised and executed. Orders are transmitted down the chain of command from a uh, <clears throat> excuse me, responsible superior, underline that, such as a commissioned officer, somebody who's put in a position of authority, a commissioned officer, to lower ranking subordinates, we would say, who either execute the order personally or transmit it down the chain as appropriate until it is received by those who expect to execute it. Let me read this again and take your time and take a note on it. Yes, this has military analogies. Sad to say, a lot of people don't realize the military analogies and how God um, is very pro-military. You see it very early on in the Bible. You can see a lot in the Old Testament, but you see a chain of command and military aspects even in the New Testament. As I said before, Paul often uses the armor of God in different military analogies in his teaching. Now, the chain of command is a succession of leaders through which command is exercised and executed. Orders are transmitted down that chain of command from a responsible supervisor, somebody who's responsible, such as a commissioned officer. It means they've been placed there for a reason, okay? Not just taking your orders from anybody. They, are, they then do what? They submit it to lower-ranking subordinates who either execute the order personally or they transmit it down that chain to the next one who needs to handle it in appropriate order until it is received by those who are expected to execute it. I'll give you a moment to note that many of you who have been in the military are going to understand this. You know, I did a few years in the Army Reserves myself, way back when, in the early 80s, 80 to 84, I was in the Army Reserves. So uh, if you've never served in the military, maybe you don't understand it, and you're going to say, well, how does the Bible apply with military analogies? My friends, the Bible is loaded with military analogies. There is rank and file in heaven. There is not equality in heaven. There is happiness. There is no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain in heaven. Absolute bliss. Amen to that. Great. But there is rank and file in heaven. This is straight out of the U.S. Army Handbook concerning rank and officers in the military, which you're looking at right here, and it applies to what we're going to be learning and talking about. So it's important to take a note on it, whether you choose to reject authority or not, but this is something out of the U.S. Army Handbook, and it continues like this. Command is exercised by what? Virtue of office 
and the special assignment of members of the armed forces holding military rank who are eligible to exercise command. They're put in that position for a reason. And because it is, they've, they've come up the chain of command. They've done what was proper along the way. And we're not to question, well, this one got a break, that one got a break. That's not the issue. If they have a rank and file and they've been put ahead of you, you need to respect that authority. That's what this talks about here. You need to understand this. This is basically a military, United States Army handbook type of definition here. Until you understand the office and rank are the issue concerning respect, you will always find fault in a human aspect of that office or rank. Let me say that again. Until you understand the office and rank are the issue concerning respect, you will always find fault in the human aspect of that office and rank. What I'm telling you is, if there is a chair or a seat of authority or a uniform of authority, you're respecting the uniform, not necessarily the person in it. I think most of you understand what I'm talking about. That needs to be important. We often say respect the president. Listen, there's been some presidents I haven't respected along the way, but I respected the office of the president, and I had to pray for them. I don't even want to get into details, but we had to pray, and we should pray, whether you agree with that person or like their personality or not. Now, in Matthew chapter 8, at this point in his ministry, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is becoming known for some pretty miraculous healings. He had just healed the leper, and then we see him in Capernaum in verse 5. So if you're in Matthew 8, go to verse 5. We studied this in our Matthew series many, many months ago, but we're going to cover this today. It fills into where we're, we're going, actually, really well today. Matthew 8, 5. And when Jesus said to Capernaum, a centurion came to him, imploring him. Now, a centurion, I've already covered this before, many of you know, is a high-ranking officer within the Roman military, okay? Matthew 8, 6. And saying, Lord, my servant is laying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented, this Roman military man you're looking at approaches and immediately does what? He speaks to the divine authority of the Lord using that pro proper title, Curios, we've talked about before. He's addressing him. He's coming him to, to the Lord with great respect. A military man, high-ranking military man, coming to a carpenter who he now believes and knows is the Lord. And he's showing that respect to him. He's using that term the right way, Curios, Lord. Matthew 8, 7, Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him immediately, no questions asked, because of the way this man's faith and belief is and his respect for authority. Matthew 8, 8, but the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. This is a man who has approached the authority of God with respect and now displays faith stronger stronger than most of the men that had been following the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ up close and personal. His, his faith is stronger than them. Now we see that faith mixed with the working knowledge of respect for authority, the chain of command, brings a mutual respect back toward him from who? The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ himself. That mixed of faith, that strong faith, mixed with the proper protocol, the chain of command, respecting authority, the right thing done in the right way, you see the Lord has a great respect for this. Matthew 8, 9, what do you see? For I also am a man under authority, the soldier said, with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and another one, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Matter of fact, it's done, chain of command. He understands this. This is a great example, folks, of a believer. Yes, it's Roman centurion, a believer who has faith, deep, strong faith, mixed with a deep, strong respect for authority because he lives it every day and it shows what happens when both of these attitudes of the strong faith and strong respect for authority, the chain of command, the protocol are mixed and working together in a believer's life. This is a good example of it. Matthew 8.10, now when Jesus heard this, he marveled and he said to those who were following, he's paying, like pay attention guys, you see this? This is the right thing done in the right way. Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. Pretty strong call. And sometimes the Lord had to do, this is one of those things when some of the men following him that were behind him that were saying, well, we've been with you for days or weeks or months now, or however long, obviously, because um, this is early in his ministry. And you're saying, he's this, this, this Roman soldier, who's really an enemy of the Jews on one level or another, comes forward, and with his respect and his attitude, he's showing stronger faith than all of us. Yes, the Lord is saying, his faith is strong because you can see it, obviously, how he approaches.
but he mixes that with the divine protocol, the, the, the chain of command, the right authority, handling the right thing in the right way. And, and Jesus is what? Impressed with saying? Thumozo is that Greek verb for marvel. Thumozo. It means admiration. That marveled word you're looking to Greek there, thumozo, it, it speaks to admiration. You're saying God admires that in a person. This is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ saying, I admire that quality enough that I will make a bold statement like this that will shock some of those around me, maybe even step on their feelings a little bit just to wake them up a little bit. Now in verse 13, it tells us the moment this military man, this positive believer we said, spoke, the servant was healed. Because Jesus respected that so much. That's what it talks about. Jump down to verse 23. Matthew 8, 23. You're already there. You should be there. Go to Matthew 8, 23. When he got out of the boat, now is another example here. Jesus got out of the boat. His disciples followed him. We're looking at how authority works and the different levels of authority. So take a look at Matthew 8, 23. So Jesus is another situation here just a little bit later on. He got out of the boat. His disciples followed him in verse 24. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea. So the boat was being covered with the waves. But Jesus himself, what, after he got in the boat? He fell asleep. The storm is upon them. And what is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ doing? Relax mental attitude. Relax. So he's so relaxed, he's taking a nap. He doesn't have to worry about it, right? And this is what he wants. He wants us to be like this during these storms. Think about what's going on right now with this virus. Have a relaxed mental attitude. Matthew 8, 25. And they came to him and woke him saying, Save us, Lord. We are perishing. Matter of fact, we're dying. They are certain they're dying. And they've been walking with the Lord. I want you to just think about this example a little earlier, how powerful that centurion came up, who was a believer, had strong faith, not only strong faith, he followed the protocol, the authority, the chain of command the right way. He did the right thing in the right way, and he could rest assured as soon as he said it, Jesus healed. Now look at these guys. Verse 25, they came to him, and they're waking him up, saying, Save us, Lord, we certainly are perishing. They're certainly dying, they're saying. So their faith is not even that strong at this moment. Again, they've already seen all these things. They just saw a centurion a little while ago, a Roman, come forward with strong faith as an example. But what are they? They're dying. Not a lot of faith considering who's in the boat with them. God is in the boat with them. <laughs> think about that. You have to think about these things. There are some scholars that believe there were a few disciples probably in the boat. Maybe, you know, there could have been 16 guys in that boat. I think those boats held about 25 um, those type of fishing boats. So who knows how many were in with him. But there could have been a few of those disciples who hadn't fully believed at this point. There's some scholars that get into that. Now, there is also some teaching on the fact that as new believers, and when, our, when we're new to the plan of God, we fluctuate in how much faith we have in God. And I firm, I'm a firm believer in that. Okay, And at times even questions his authenticity, maybe. Either way, you have an incredible event taking place here. And we're looking at faith and how strong is faith. Matthew 8, 26. Jesus said to them, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? Then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the sea and it became perfectly calm. As soon as he stood up and said a word and raised his hand, immediately a storm stopped. Matthew 8, 27. The men were amazed, and I think, amen, we would be too, right? And said, What kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea, what, obey? Obey him. To be in complete subjection to the, to the uh, power of God. You're seeing the winds being like a slave. They're completely controlled by God. It is the present active indicative of the Greek verb hupokulo you're looking at. Hupokulo, okay? To be in complete subjection to God, to Him, Jesus Christ. Having authority, complete control over a situation or a person. That's what it speaks to. And is the present active indicative of that Greek verb Hupokuo, meaning it was, present active indicative, a was, always will be something the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has complete control of. Always was, always will be. Complete control over everything, weather patterns, everything. A virus that's going on, no matter what it is, believers. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is God. He has complete control and authority over everything. Always has, always will. The Apostle Paul may have said it best in, to the Colossians, Colossians 1.16. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things 
have been created through him and for him. Verse 17, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. As a baby in the, in the hands of Mary, Jesus Christ still was God holding the universe together. He's standing on this boat right now. If anybody had doubted that God was walking among them at that point in time, they should have doubted no more. When you think about the faith of that centurion, that Roman who was not even a Jew, the Roman soldier coming over there and talking to the Lord like that and recognizing that's God, I'm going to walk over there, show my respect for him immediately. My faith is strong. As soon as he, he even looks at me, the process of the healing is already going to take place. That's strong faith, and that's the protocol, authority way to approach it, the right thing done in the right way. Until you recognize the one true authority of the universe, you have not come to fully believe in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Until you recognize that He is God, that He is the one way, the one Savior, until you recognize the one true authority of the universe, you have not come to fully believe in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The first step, folks, to understanding authority and the chain of command is who is the ultimate authority. The first step to understanding the chain of command and authority, the lesson we're learning about, is recognizing who is the ultimate authority, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Then ask yourself, who are you under authority to? Because you're under authority to something or someone. Who are you under authority to? Romans 6.16 says what? What does Paul teach there? Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as a slaves for obedience, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, follow, bow down to? In your mind, it starts first. Not just physical bowing down. You bow down in your mind first. Either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. Good question Paul throws out there. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. There is no middle ground, folks. There is no middle ground. We are either under the authority of the one true God of the universe, or we are under the authority of the small God, small g, God of this world, Satan. You're in the flesh or in the new man, one or the other. There's no middle ground, folks. First Peter chapter 3 we're going to turn to. I'm sure this message rubs some folks the wrong way. Unfortunately, I have to be academically honest and teach you where the Spirit's leading me, what the Scripture says. Everyone believes they're independent creatures. I know they do. Because I know what the world, the cosmic system, Satan's world promotes. The God of this world, Satan. What does he promote? Independent creatures. And everyone wants to believe that. We're all free thinkers. We have no authority over us. A lot of folks like to believe that. We're all free. Yeah, okay, freedom. Yeah, all right. Sorry to tell you that it's a satanic lie designed to keep you in bondage to the cosmic system and the lies therein. Cosmic system. Okay, ladies. We're getting ready to, to address something here, and I, I just thought about it. Um, you might get upset and turn this off. If you're living in your emotions and being subjective, you probably will. The choice is yours. I'm just a mouthpiece for God, the Holy Spirit, who's trying to teach everyone. Not my words. These are God's words. So as you go into 1 Peter chapter 3, ladies, I'm giving you fair warning. This is not about you. This is about authority and the chain of command and understanding it. Take it however you want. It's God, the Holy Spirit. It's not Rick. It's not Pastor Rick, okay? It's God. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Until we understand these principles, folks, and these are good examples, um, and start to apply them and realize it's not about respecting the flesh of another person. It's about respecting the Lord first, and everything else falls under that. You'll understand what I'm talking about. If not, you'll turn the channel and be upset because you're being hypersensitive and subjective and emotional. It is what it is. 1 Peter where are we? First Peter 3, 1 Peter 3.1. Let's read it together. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient, and especially unbelievers, disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. There's a lot right in that statement there that I'm not going to get into today. But it just goes to show that how we apply things in our life and how we live affects those around us. That's what really it speaks of. Emphasis on the wife's behavior, not her words, not her nagging and yelling at the man and causing problems, her behavior, the emphasis on the application, the behavior of a Christian woman doing her best to follow the plan of God. Now, we all fail. We all fall short. So let's just relax and take a breath. We all just need to do our best. But yes, we fall short. That's okay. Let's read on here. First Peter 3, 2. 
as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. First Peter 3, 3, your admon uh, adornment, excuse me, must not be merely external, not just the exterior stuff, braiding of the hair, wearing gold jewelry, putting on dresses. God's word promotes femininity. What? Yes, God's word promotes femininity for ladies, meaning a woman can dress and act like a woman. Yes, that's a good thing, folks. I know in the year of our Lord 2020, we lost sight of that because Satan's the god of this world, and he wants ladies to be like men and men to be like ladies, but that's not where we're at. But the most important principle is how does that woman think? The outside stuff is nice, but how does she think? Beauty comes from within the soul structure. Beauty for a woman comes from within the soul structure. A handsome man... A leading man, that comes from within his soul structure. It's not his muscles. It's nothing to do with it. It's not his exterior. It starts in here first, and it comes out afterwards, okay? So beauty comes from within. First Peter 3, 4, but let it be the hidden person of the heart, soul structure, the mind, with the imper imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, not somebody who's combative all the time, which is precious in the sight of the Lord. This speaks to a doctrinal woman applying God's word to her life, walking in her new nature consistently. Yes, we fail and fall. The man will, the woman will. That's not what I'm saying. It's not about perfection, folks. The perfect one died on the cross. It's about recognizing there is a protocol in God's plan. I'm going to do my best to follow it. I'm going to have good days and bad days. Relax and take a breath if you're still with me, ladies, because this is supposed to apply to the men, too. You can put an unbelieving supermodel, listen to me, you can put an unbelieving supermodel next to an average-looking woman who, is a, who has Christ in her life, a believer, and her beauty will come out in her words and action, and you will quickly see the surface of the beauty supermodel, unbeliever, fade compared to the doctrinal woman, the Christian woman, once you're around them for a little period of time. I'm not talking about the surface talking about what comes out after a period of time, you'll notice. In other words, a very handsome man can be very ugly. A very beautiful woman can be very ugly when you get around them and realize what they're really all about. First Peter 3, 5. For in this way, in former times, the holy woman also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Notice that key principle. Not everybody else in the room, their own husbands. First Peter 3, 6. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, called him Lord, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. The title is one of respect you're looking at. Divine royalty, because Christ has established that seed of authority, nothing to do with the man, the human, the flesh. It's not the issue. Until you, until you learn to get your eyes off people's flesh and understand the protocol plan of God and how things are designed and laid out or done in the right way, you're going to always be looking at somebody's mistakes or failures of their flesh. That's not the issue, folks. The same word there, though, obey. Hupo okuo is, is used. When the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ had to see under control, it's the same word. It's a powerful word. It means under control. It's under authority. That's, don't freak out, ladies. We're going to cover everything here. Just relax. And curios is the term Lord. We've, we've learned about it. We studied it. Notice you become daughters of Sarah in your new nature, just like she struggled because she didn't get it right all the time, and she failed, and then finally began to apply the word of God. So, too, you can resemble her. So look, look at that word, curios, Lord. We've studied it before. Yes, divine authority. It, it's, it's respecting the Lord, really, is what it's all about. Don't make it about the man. Don't make it about the woman. Whatever it is, the chain of command. But we've learned about this before. Curious. And notice you become daughters of Sarah in your new nature when you're applying the word of God. And yes, she struggled and failed. If you don't know that much about her, she did. And she finally began to apply God's word and line up in God's plan. That's what you want to do, ladies, as well. Now, men... Here we go. Men, wake up. More is put on you than is on her. All right, men, 1 Peter 3, 7. You husbands, there you go. In the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered, men, leaders in the household. Weaker is actually meant in the physical sense here. Understand that. The physical sense. Not the mental sense. 
because let me tell you something, oftentimes a wife or a woman can be mentally stronger sometimes and smarter, that's okay, than her husband in some areas, not all areas, you shouldn't have a, a hopefully you don't have a, a husband who's an emotional wreck and who's not that bright, but it's, it's not uncommon to have a very smart woman in, in certain areas or a very strong woman in certain areas inside, and sometimes women are stronger than men in a lot of areas or smarter than men, that's okay. A smart man will understand this is the, who God gave me as my helper mate and I'm going to respect her and lift her up and I'm going to listen to her ideas because she's smart and I can learn from her and she can learn from me, both back and forth. But ultimately the man is in control, he is the authority, okay? It means men though, you are her protector. You are her protector in the sense that you stand in front, you take the hit to protect her. The physical sense of the word as well. Showing your wife honor means you what? Take the role of head of household very serious you lift her up in honor because you live if you live in your flesh in that role is a good chance your prayers will not be answered That's what it's telling you you want to live in your flesh you want to live in your old sin nature ignore the, the doctrinal Bible doctrinal principles that should be in a marriage then don't expect your prayers to be answered. blessings from God will be delayed or even blocked by your attitude and treatment of her I, you don't want to hear that, men. Okay, you want to, you like the stuff about the ladies, men. Some of your blessings will be blocked. Your prayers will not be heard because you aren't applying the word of God to your marriage and your wife. In fact, most men struggle with authority that we were given. All of us, welcome to the human race. It is not easy because we struggle with our old sin nature just like she does. Male pride, though, and male ego are easily shattered much more easily than when a woman's ego or pride, I would say. Not that they don't have them, it's just men are much more fragile in that area. They're much easier to hurt. I always say, and it's, uh, it's probably a fact, that uh, a woman can get over a man cheating much easier than a man can get over a woman cheating. When men are much more hypersensitive. So we both have our failures and weaknesses. It'll relax, enjoy, laugh at it, it's okay. Apply the word of God, walk in the new nature, folks. Colossians 3.18 tells us what? Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Nothing about him. It's about the Lord, ladies. Verse 19, husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Women must maintain respect. That's their call. Husbands must love without allowing bitterness in their soul structure. That's their call. That's the protocol plan of God. That's the, that's the divine order of God. We need to understand these things when we talk about authority, the chain of command, and these divine establishments that God set up. Whether you choose to believe that or not is up to you. And if you're having problems in your marriage, look back on the, on the area of respect for authority. The divine protocol is the word of God in your marriage. That's all I can tell you, folks. I'm not, you know, I'm not your enemy, or am I your enemy for telling you the truth? I'm not trying to set myself up to be anybody's enemy. This is just how it is. God designed the car, okay? Uh, the God designed the car. If you're not following the instructions and the owner's manual of the car, don't jump in it and drive it. Because it's a sports car you don't understand. And you need the instruction manual. It's called the Bible. But both of us, men and women, have a call to duty that they both recognize authority, how to live in it, and in their calling. And even outside of marriage, there's always authority all around us. The authority of the word is the ultimate one. A woman who disrespects or ridicules the husband breaks down his confidence and ultimately undermines his authority, and the same for the husband. So if you want a, a, a mouse in the bedroom, ladies, hey, we're all adults here, keep undermining and cut him away at his authority with your tongue. Keep making him feel bad. Men, you want, you want a, a hot tamale in the marriage, or do you want a wet, cold rag in the marriage? We're all adults here. We can laugh, okay? You, you, what you say and how you treat her are going to make a big difference. We need to pay attention to these things, folks. This is why some marriages are, f are floundering around. They're not operating inside the plan of God. Now, we all fail and fall. I'm trying to make you laugh a little bit in all this as well. But think about that. When a woman disrespects or breaks down that authority in the marriage toward the husband, it's going to affect all aspects of that marriage. Inside the bedroom, outside the bedroom. Men, you want to break down that marriage and have all kinds of misery? and how all kinds of coldness and ice between you and her. Keep showing her that you're a bitter, angry person or you want to be a tyrant as a leader in the household. This is what I'm telling you, folks. Any bitterness toward the wife breaks down her confidence in her role as well. 
any disrespect towards the man breaks down his. This is just how it is. And this carries on every aspect of life concerning the Word of God. The first authority we all need to recognize is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That will set you free to live in the role that God designed you for. But until you recognize Jesus Christ as the head, and you need to follow his mind, the Bible, you're never going to, you're never going to live in the role you were designed for. In fact, it is only the authority of the Lord and the Savior Jesus Christ that will set us free from the grip of Satan and that he's put on this world since the fall in the garden. Romans 8.20, what does Paul teach there? For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope, verse 21, that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery. Yes, since the garden there has been a form of slavery. There's a reason there's not perfection in this world. And it's not God, capital G, it's God, small g, of this world, Satan. It's in form of slavery to corruption and to the freedom of the glory of the children of God. That's what that speaks of. That's what that speaks of. Since the fall in the garden, there's been something going on. Now, if you want you want some perfect, some some um, glimpse of perfection, start to live in the Word of God. Start to live in your role. Understand the divine protocol and the plan of God. Understand the uh, divine chain of command and authority and the different ways it applies in your life. James 4, 17. Therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do, folks, does not do it. It is sin. Plain and simple. People ask, what, what is sin? There's a lot about sin. What, whatever lacks of faith is sin. Whatever you know is right to do and you know it's part of the plan of God, and it's common sense a lot of it, folks. We know. That's sin. Don't play games. Once a believer hears the truth and knows it, they become responsible for that truth. It's up to you, folks. We're all big boys and big girls here. There is an age of accountability. I spoke to somebody recently about it. We've taught on it before. I know Colonel Thien, Pastor Bob at gbible.org has taught on it. I taught on an age of accountability. That could be anywhere from, who knows, 14 or 15 years old till uh, 21 years old. I don't know. You know, for everybody it's different. But there is an age of accountability where God says, they've heard the gospel enough, there's been some truth bounced off them enough, they need to take responsibility. At that point, you've reached an age of accountability. It is on you, folks. The chain of command and the plan of God is evident and important. Without it, we have no peace or prosperity. In fact, God stands against rebellion. The chain of command and the plan of God, authority, the chain of command, the things I'm teaching you, is evident and important. Without it, we have no peace or prosperity. In fact, God stands against rebellion. In the family, in the business, government, church, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where it happens. Rebellion against authority goes against the teaching of the Bible. And we've all done it. I was rebellious. I was a, I was a wild man. My teens and my 20s, those people that know me, that, that I've seen on Facebook in recent weeks that I stayed away from for a long time, they know. They know who, what I was about. I, I'm far from I, I wrote it in my book. That, yeah, you're dealing with somebody. That, they, there's people that don't even know the worst things I did when I moved out of state and went and, and, and jumped around and lived in different states, the things I was involved in. So, and I'm not, a, I'm not bragging about it, nor am I ashamed of it. It's just a plain fact. But God can use you. God can heal you. Trust me, you're looking at it. 1 Peter 5.5, 5, you younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. And all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is, is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We need to understand respect for authority. We need to understand a divine protocol. We need to understand there is a chain of command. There are divine establishments in God's plan. As we get ready to close this lesson, I want to highlight some of the main principles we've been covering in the last two lessons. I made a couple of jokes about marriage today because that's tough to teach on when you're talking about the man loving the woman the right way like Christ loved the church or the woman respecting the man. People get all up in arms. They think, oh, you're trying to be a you're chauvinist, you're this, you're that. You know something? Satan wants you to do the exact opposite of the Bible. That's why we're in the state we're in today and we have people mutilating their bodies in, in surgeries trying to change from one gender to another. Because they've gone that far away from the plan of God and they follow the God of this world, Satan. So as we get ready to close, I'm going to highlight some principles here. The need for a divine authority and recognition to the protocol of the chain of command is written everywhere in Scripture, folks. Start, it starts in the garden, but starting first with the divine authority of Almighty God Himself. Until you recognize that and learn to live in that, you're going to have problems in your life, folks. That's just the way it is. Without that in place and upheld, all other levels of human or even angelic authority crumbles, falls by the wayside. Satan rebelled in eternity past against the divine authority in eternity past, and chaos and evil what ensued after that. And Satan was the highest ranking angel. 
He was like a bodyguard, if you really understand the original language, how he's written about in the Bible. He was considered a bodyguard of the throne of Christ. So how come he's, he's allowed to the highest level in, a different, in a different stages of heaven where, where there's only the main authority is God and the Trinity itself, and yet Satan is allowed as a protector of divine throne room, and he was given all these privileges and power, and that wasn't enough. That just goes to show, folks, no matter how much we think we're going to get, it's never enough. So be very careful. Understand these principles. You better understand divine authority. And you better get comfortable with the fact is that there is an authority over you in life. It always is. There is a chain of command in life, and the top of the chain is God himself, God Almighty. Satan rebelled against that, and this is what we've got today, folks. That is really the one example we need is Satan. It's a great example. The divine establishment of freedom, free will, is only functional when there are restrictions and responsibility attached to that freedom, which all stem from from following a what a protocol of divine authority and that chain of command we're learning about. Divine establishment, freedom. A lot of people, you know, when you're 16, 17 years old, and unfortunately there's some 30 and 40 years old that have uh, folks that have a 16-year-old mentality, they think freedom is just chaos. I do what I want to do. No, because that steps on the freedom of somebody else. Freedom and free will come with responsibility, restrictions. That's real freedom. Freedom comes at a cost. We know that, right? Freedom isn't chaos. There's a difference between freedom and chaos, folks. Christian marriage and the family unit all depend upon a chain of command and divine authority being upheld, starting with the priority of keeping Christ as the head. Always recognize that every day. And his mind, which is the Bible, folks, as the driving force behind the decisions, the agendas, and lifestyle choices each and every day. If you don't have this going on in your Christian marriage, you're going to have problems if you haven't them already. Okay, Christian marriage, the family unit, all depend upon a chain of command. They depend upon recognizing divine authority being upheld, starting with the priority of what? Keeping Christ as the head each and every day. And in his mind, being the most important thing that you understand, because it's the Bible, that's the driving force behind the decisions and the agendas and lifestyle choices you should make. We're going to be getting into nationalism a little bit next time. I, I, uh, the Spirit's leading me to really uh, dig deep into this principle because of what's going on in our world today where we're at and um, it just seems to be where the spirit's leading me so I don't reject that when I know I'm being led in a direction I just go forward in it I don't question it because I'm not bright enough to question God I know the authority that's over me so every head is bowed every eye is closed father we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word bless these messages take them out to a lost and dying world through your son's precious name our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ amen